traveled into the soil, uh, the snows that had fallen and so forth. And here's one of the, the uh, uh, plants here, the Aztec lily uh, which uh, today has lost its voice according to many elders. Because people no longer uh, one can pay attention to the plant. But on the other hand, there's no precipitation when the plant comes out. This is a geophyte, and so it's responding more to its cat is talking about to warm the sunlight and to tell us when the rains are coming. This is because things have changed drastically. Uh, one of our, our major projects, which is now underway, uh, dealing with agrobiodiversity in the area, started in 2010. 2010 started a three-year drought where not one millimeter of rain fell in the area. They planted up their seed, first year, nothing happened. Planted up the second year, nothing happened, so there's very little more. And the third year, uh, we began a program which we, uh, I will mention a few examples here a little bit later on. But you can see here from this graph that it was not a severe drought. It was not an extreme drought. It was an exceptional drought. Now what's happening now is these drought periods are becoming longer and the frequency is increasing. So consequently, the Zerali are particularly interested in how they're going to respond to this. As Margarita of Agero, my Zerali mother says, uh, we are used to bringing up with hunger and they have different ways of dealing with this. And some of this has been genetically coded, which we found out later on. And in this case here, they anticipate with five years storage of food, especially drying uh, and dehydrating, especially immature products from the milpa, the agricultural system, that their, their cultivated fields, uh, so that they can have enough food to last if there is a shortage. Here's a, uh, a little book that we did in the 1970s, a bilingual, but I will be Spanish book with photos and so forth of school children to help them learn about their food plants. Later, it was published by the Mexican government in their series of traditional uh, gastronomy. And uh, with this, we can see here in a community which runs along the environmental gradient, the spinal forest, the tropical forest, and the, the dry tropical forest. Uh, we documented 153 plants, animals, and fungi. And as you can see from the graph here, 71% of the plants were found in forests. Only 10 plants were actually cultivated. 5% were volunteers, what we would call weeds. And there were also a few garden plants, 19 garden plants. These are mostly introduced plants brought in by the missionaries over 400 years. If we take a, a breakdown here, how it's distributed among three different ecological systems, so three different uh, uh, forest systems that are found in the area. The 40% are found in the pine forest up top, 40% essentially down in the dry tropical forest, and then 28% in the middle thin oak woodland. Of these, we can find that there are 28 species that are promoted by anthropogenic activities within the forest. We don't have as many as cat was presented here, but of course we're looking here only one, one uh, small community. Now when we talk about how they interact with the forest, as I mentioned, the milpa system, their cultivation system is particularly important, and they have it divided into two major groups. One is rasa. This is the land you work, this is the land you plow. This is the introduced system. But it's interesting, as we'll see in a moment, how this introduced system blended into the forest systems in this area. The traditional way of doing things for thousands of years, as still is being done today in other parts of Mexico, is Mauichi. This is the Sweden, a, a, a form of uh, cut and burn. But then it's regenerated over a 20 year cycle. As you can see here, the Yuga Madrensis. Uh, uh, over on your right, uh, which is a protected tree within the system because it's a sacred tree. This is where the spirits come to protect the land. And so uh, these systems are integrated into the uh, oak woodland forest in this case. Within the milpa system, we have our traditional three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. Oh, we have any other plants? What they go here? Some more for David. It's one of the 
plants we looked at for many years in the area. Uh, but we have other uh, cultivated plants such as amaranth, chia, and so forth. But one of the other things that's important here is that the short growing season, usually only three months, uh, does not assure that you're going to have all your crops maturing at the same time. And as a result, they have developed these different systems of desecrated food in anticipation of this potential crop loss. First, we'll take a look at maize. Mexico is particularly important. Here we have the uh, 52 different races of maize currently recognized in Mexico. Uh, a tremendous diversity derived from Eusimple, the wild or mother maize. When you look at the Sierra Catamara, uh, it's particularly important because from this map you can see there are five centers of domestication of maize. Maize domestication was not an event. It was a process over thousands of years with different culture groups involved. But more importantly today, for conservation and for the future, it's the diversification centers that are important. How humans are selectively and actively manipulating these maize plants, each agricultural cycle for the future. And as we can see here, the Cerro Carmel is one of the four major diversification centers in Mexico, the country of origin of the maize. They make a series of different products depending on the part of the plant, the part of the time of the agricultural cycle, and so forth, the Cenu. And here the list, as we know, is the most important. This is the fermented corn here, uh, which will come to in a moment. Pinoli, the pop beer, pop the uh, uh, kernels, and so forth. They have particularly good uh, nutritional profiles. This is just one looking just the, the the protein content, much better than the commercial maize used today in Mexico. And one of the reasons why they rejected introduced maize that the government keeps trying to force upon them. Also, uh, their maize has evolved to be resilient to drought. The two major systems in, involve the root and the mesocotyledon. The mesocotyledon, the, uh, the commercial maize, is usually only about five centimeters. So when you plant it in the surface of the soil, roots sprout out. In the Tarahumara area, it's 20 centimeters. So they're able to take advantage of the residual water in the soil. The soil is very, very shallow there, but there's residual water, and this allows them, when there's sufficient rain, to survive cycle to cycle. The other interesting thing here is it's hydrotrophic. The roots look for water, and as with some of our colleagues in the biotechnology sector, we have these little mazes, hydroponic mazes that they these force these maize to go through. We don't use mice, we use corn. <laughs> Unfortunately, what's happening is that maize is becoming a commodity product of a product. The tremendous pressure for removing cellulose, timber, roll timber, lumber, and so forth from the forest is pressuring the Tawamara to give up more and more of their rights to, to the land, forest lands and to return for maize, the maize that's usually uh, introduced because the deforestation has ruined the fertility of the soil. We also have beans, a tremendous uh, a diversity of beans, both the Fasiolus vulgaris, as we see here, but also Fasiolus coccinius, the scarlet runner bean. And here we have a very interesting case of another function of placing these milpas within the pineal forest. The pineal forest is a genetic reservoir that gives genetic information to the domesticated uh, uh, scarlet runner bee. And uh, through the various uh, 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 mark pollen and genetic markers and so forth, we've been able to demonstrate a move, a flow, genetic flow of genes for uh, uh, ecophysiological changes, floral changes, and so forth that permit these scarlet runner bees to produce very rapidly under uh, very adverse conditions. And they can usually mature within one month uh, sooner than most of the scarlet runner bees found in the rest of Mexico. And within the, uh, the populations we find, uh, as you can see in the lower right hand corner, hybrids between these species still present today. Include, in fact, the Toramar themselves 
uh, talk about the need to move their technology fields to the forest, near to the forest, uh, every five years to renovate them, to rejuvenate them. So this is built into their mythology. They have uh, three species of, of uh, squash, and this, these three species are distributed along the ecological gradient. And the important component of the forest here is that the squash bees live within the forest. When the forest have been uh, uh, cut down, usually by illegal cutting and so forth, squash production is reduced, probably because of the disturbance of the habitat in the squash, uh, squash bees. And then there's a whole series of plants, which we call leaves, about 120 species of edible greens, which we call filipes, like ilibas. We won't have time to go into that, but uh, tomorrow afternoon we'll be presenting one of our films uh, on uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, gastronomic uh, manipulation of quilites uh, in the Toronto of Quilite Pasado. So we hope that you'll be able to take a look at more details on uh, how uh, this system works. Much of our research is participatory research uh, because it's important that these people learn the importance of connection between Western science and their native science. And here we can see uh, some of the work that we're doing in the mill itself, looking at how they can uh, do inventory work, quantitative work. And the important aspect here that we that uh, falls uh, into the category of collaborative research is that the ecotone between the forest and the nilpa is critical for the agriculture and subsistence of the people. And we can see here in this graph uh, where the yellow marker is marking the milpa is where we find a number of important uh, medicinal plants and uh, utility plants. We'll take a look at a couple of them here. The wild potatoes, which probably are not really wild, uh, because they're, they're different from the wild ancestors in the forest themselves, the different uh, 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 kinds of uh, dajitis, uh, marigolds that are consumed, uh, the wild uh, sweet tomatoes, the blue seed called tomatas, and a whole series of plants are found on the margin between the milpa and the forest. Perhaps the most important plant, and the one that's a concern to them, because with the introduction of uh, herbicides, the, the agricultural engineers want to help them improve their form by killing off their weeds. Well, these, uh, these uh, uh, practices end up killing off dromas, baseau, the trinillo. And as it turns out, this is the source of the yeast in their tezuino. They make tezuino, germinating the corn, kernels, grinding them up, putting them into a, uh, a vessel, a clay vessel, and there's a 32 stage germination, a 32 stage fermentation process with different bacteria and yeast, the last one being the beer yeast. And where does the beer yeast come from? From the bromus plant itself. And so for them, if they don't have bromus growing uh, along their cornfields, they don't have bromus to collect, to put into their fermenting pots. So for them, this is very important because their dances and all their festivities, their social organization itself revolves around the sharing of Tasmania. They do not live in villages. They live one over in this ranch over here, another one a few kilometers over there and so forth. So they have to get together and the social lubricant turns out to be their fermented beverage. And so you can see what they do then on the, on the uh, on the lower left side is my, my first student when I was at the University of Colorado who, who discovered uh, many of these things. And on the other side is a recent student who's still, we're still drinking as we know. <laughs> so. but. Now, the other aspect here is the soil. We have the milk and so forth, but we have to take a look at what's happening with the soil. And one of the things that's important here is that we don't have good soil. You can see on the left side here, the whole series of soil profiles have been taken, but none of those are agricultural soils. They're all volcanic and mineralized soils. And the other problem is that we have a high rate of erosion, the highest rate of erosion in Mexico, with this very steep 
uh, slot size on the payment slopes of what I'm just to call them. But they, the Toromara say, we need to have healthy productive workers who then force, force them to be healthy and have these numbers because they control the erosion, interrupt the accumulation of the soil elements, basically organic and mineral elements, through their terraces, as we can see here. Now this system is, is, a, is a, an antique system, Lumos, or not that antique, but Lumos uh, 130 years ago, uh, documented this in the area. And uh, we can still see it uh, functioning today. But we can go with the geographers and archaeologists we've discovered that there are some of these terraces that are still present. The soil fertility is still very high compared to the native soil. And doing some experimental uh, cultivation still produces the milk uh, uh, on uh, experimental conditions. Now, some of the forest also has to be maintained healthy from the viewpoint of the indigenous people. And oftentimes, when we talk about medicinal plants, we find that the medicinal plants grow in the forest. But even though I, as a botanist, would say this is a Sakalian decompositum here, Sakalian decompositum there, the botanist is one of the four medicinal plants of the area. The ones that grow in these groves, sacred groves, have much more power, have much more efficiency in treating diseases than the one that grows uh, outside of it. And so uh, over time, we began to learn that they do have these special groves, which, of course, when the forest system in a town creates quite a bit of conflict. But one of the ways you can identify this, as you can see here, is a hikori. They plant peyote within these forests. So now whenever we're out, we always are being careful uh, with our guides to be sure that we don't go collecting in peyote forests. There are also other sacred plants, and in this case, we're down in the dry tropical forest. This is the Brazil wood, which is used uh, in many areas today as a dye. But this is also the uh, wood that gives rise to the authority cane. The canes that the authority, the indigenous authorities carry around, and everybody has to uh, obey anyone who's carrying the stick. But also, it's used as a seeing stick for hippity for the peyote ceremonies that they have there. And you see one of the peyote raspers here singing to the peyote uh, with his rasping stick. So these plants are particularly important uh, as well in these dry. Now, many of these trees are managed culturally. Sometimes as an individual tree, sometimes as, as a, a small grove. We can see here on the left a pine tree and an oak tree. Sort of look rather stunted and deformed and so forth. But these are cultural trees. They've been coppiced, they've been transformed over time, and people still respect them. On one hand, we can see the production of pote, these pitch sticks, which are very important for lighting fires. We're providing illumination in the night and so forth. There's no kind of electricity up there. There's only, only a few, few places that have electrical lights going in. And so these, uh, the, the uh, bottle gas doesn't make it. There was a big international gas coming across the Tarabana now. Uh, they don't have access to, to their contemporary uh, fossil fuel. And we can see here how they burn and acts away at the base of these trees for producing these aquatic sticks or pitch sticks. We can look at other trees here and see how we're deformed. We can see what Kate was talking about, we're removing some of the branches. They do this as well. These are sacred trees. Of course, these are the ones that the forest people like because they have clean wool. I have to confess, I am a forester, so I do like those kind of trees. Um, but you can see the tree on the left side looks rather deformed and so forth. But if you take a closer look with that red arrow, this is where they store their corn. So they bend the branches of these different trees so they can store the corn after they cut off the top and dry it up so they have forage for their animals during winter time. So this is a whole process on which the milpa and the forest are integrated. Coppicing is particularly important for production of fuel and post in particular. Uh, in the fine oak forest. Down in the tropical forest, it's even more interesting. There's, there's a new group of coppicing trees, uh, Ravia, and this is the preferred tree for making candles 
for the knives that are used to scar the opium pots. So I found that, uh, that uh, whenever I found these kinds of trees, I had to be very careful that I didn't get into a bit of a opium pumping field down there in the, the tangents. <coughs> but the, these, these coppicing uh, uh, techniques and polishing techniques are they're still used uh, in different parts of, uh, of the state of the mine. The tomorrow is we saw earlier, like to run, would like to move ahead in, in uh, commercial routes and so forth. And in this region, as you saw with the maze uh, map, is one of the major migration routes north and south. And these uh, migration routes have little groves of special trees. In this case, uh, uh, is a pinion tree, which is way out of its native range of pinion. But it's along one of the major routes along the, the continental divide. And the elders always talk about this as being one of the sacred trees because it's where their ancestors camped up. This is the neutral area, the, the neutral area where they were not able, they were not permitted to fight with their enemies. One of the major enemies were the Apaches who came down from, the, from what today is the United States. But these were neutral areas and uh, they promoted. Uh, the pine groves also had a certain uh, uh, oak groves of the same sort. And in particular, the, uh, the oak tree that I could never identify that they eat the acorns of every year turns out to be uh, a new species according to Stolenberg. So uh, consequently, uh, some of these, these trees may actually be a result of hybridization and selection still in the process. There are other trees that have suffered or been promoted through anthropogenic augmentation. These are consumption sites, activity sites, where there are succulent fruits that have to be eaten at the moment. They're perishable and they cannot be transported. One of them, for instance, is the randy, the tropical randy, uh, which has this gooey, blacky, uh, stinky, but sweet uh, uh, endocarp full of black seeds. And so you sit under the tree in the shade in the, in the forest, in the tropical forest, cut it open, eat all that, it, and then you leave the seed there, and then the growth increases, increases. The same thing happens with pitaya, the, the sweet uh, cactus fruit that forms these, the pitaya forest, where people stop along the roadside on their migration uh, to eat. What we're doing now is, uh, in addition to documenting all this information, uh, as well as uh, with the older people, uh, filming these so that they can share with the Dutrarabri who are, uh, unfortunately don't believe anything unless it's on the screen. So, we're, so now we're adapting ourselves to the technology so that we hope we can uh, uh, promote this indigenous knowledge through, through videos, which as I mentioned we'll show one tomorrow. Uh, we're also looking into uh, applying traditional uh, uh, practices, uh, forest management in terms of restoration. Uh, many of the areas have been degraded because of clandestine logging, and the Taramara want to reforest them. Uh, unfortunately, the official forestry programs, reforestation programs, uh, bring in uh, exotic pines, they plant them out, and they have less than 1% survival rate in the following year. Um, we've been trying to get many to do mycorrhizal. Uh, inoculation in the, in the nurseries, but we still still have a name that uh, that can, can is still cover on that program. But the local people, in this case, in the dry tropical forest, are interested in using their traditional practices. And one of the practices that, that we're looking at at the moment is uh, applied to three plants that have over collection. They've been overly collected to the point where the foreigners, that is, people from the outside. Mexicans, but as well as Germans, Japanese, uh, uh, have come in because it's so hot and dry down there, there are not many deer stations around. They cut everything down and then take them to the nearest shade. And so the, the Capsicum annual, it's, it's hard easier, I'm not going to try to figure out what some species it is. Uh, and the wild chili pepper there, uh, a gum, ari, and copalquin, which is a the finite producing plant, which is almost now extinct in Mexico due to uh, the land in Europe. Uh, we're in the process of working with them to re uh, restore these tropical areas. Some of these areas in Mexico also are marijuana fields that have been abandoned now that the states are growing, you know, guys are growing marijuana here. 
uh, Mark or Mota in Mexico. And so they, they wanted to grow other plants. And so we're working on uh, the chili pepper here in terms of uh, providing a canopy with the native trees under which, which act as mother trees, under which the chili peppers will grow. And then uh, people can uh, harvest these. Uh, this little bag here, which is about a quarter of a kilo of uh, chip pepin, sells for the equivalent of about $50 mm -hmm. there. On the international market, it sells for about four to $500. So uh, this is something which is now drawing attention. Uh, of course, there's an over demand for this. And the, uh, the people who are concerned about uh, the foreigners coming in and ripping off their plants uh, to take away the chili harvest. So we're promoting here the traditional harvesting techniques, uh, working with the, with the students and technicians and local people who are setting up different plots uh, for monitoring uh, productivity. Uh, we can see here two different systems. One, the lower system, uh, was an open agricultural uh, field where they tried planting out the uh, wild chili pepper. Problem is that wild chili pepper doesn't like growing out in the sun. Uh, we're also finding the differences in the pericarp, the differences in the texture, in fact, in the uh, sensorial lab is showing that there are differences in flavor. Uh, also, in, uh, in the shade grown, a typical uh, system of uh, the chili pepper, uh, we're finding that per hectare we can get two to four times as much uh, uh, saleable chili peppers. So, uh, there's a lot of interest in terms of applying traditional forest techniques to potential commercial plants. Now, I'd like to close uh, talking about animals because one of the things we always complain about here in our society is that we always focus on plants and we have to realize there's other worlds out there as well. They're animals. And this fits in very well with this agroforestry theme because the second system, uh, the milpa, uh, the wasa, is an introduction from, by the Spaniards. They brought in the plow. They brought in the traction animals, the oxen, and the mules, the horses, and so forth. And they also brought in goats and sheep, the minor livestock. And it turns out uh, the Tarahara did not accept them so much as a source of protein or a source of hide, although they do use them very For them, these goats and sheep are important for converting the forest into fertilizer. And so they herd out every day their little, little uh, animals out into the forest. They go on munching on all the different plants and so forth around. And then they bring them back and make a deposit in the evening. And then about every week they move their corral around. So they end up fertilizing these, these soils, which normally are very poor in, in organic matter and particular nitrogen. So as, as a result, the forests are the source of fertilizer for the soils. Now, what some people may say, well, maybe these, these little beasts are destroying the biodiversity. It's a little joke among themselves in Mexico, when we see a goat or a sheep, we say, well, the biodiversity is gone here. There are competitors. So we have to race ahead of them to get their to bring specimens before, before they get eaten. But uh, we decided to take a look at, at one case here. Uh, this is Cianopus opes. Uh, this is a pretty important plant for the Californians uh, because in uh, California, full of Cianopus, and uh, as I remember, it was a couple weeks ago when they talked about the California Lala, and they wanted to see what the California Lala was, and it turns out to be a Cianopus. Well, as it turns out, uh, the genus Cianopus is derived from the Madre Tertiary Flora of the Sierra Madre across the top. And uh, according to the uh, great California botanist Stevens and his equal phylogeny of Cianopus, the basal species, the fundamental species, is uh, the Cianopus and the Sierra Tarahumata, the endemic species in the Sierra Tarahumata. And from there, over uh, millions of years, it, 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 one group went up into the basic habitats a little further north in, the, in California, into the many parts of days. Uh, California Lala, and the other group it, it extended into uh, the desert areas and had thorns and all kinds of nasty things, very little foliage associated with it. And but the primitive forms still exist in 
and say, oh, oh, what? So it gives us a pre-adaptive situation for accepting European agriculture and integrating it into forest. And if we take a look at the comparison of plots between unbroused population sea notice and browsed population sea notice, we can see there is a structural difference. Uh, the unbroused uh, condition, we have very tall plants and, and they look very good. In the browsed situation, they're very short. But if we take a look at the palatable biomass of these plants, we actually find that these short, stubby plants actually being pruned back by these animals and they produce greater biomass per hectare. Now, uh, the other component here, which uh, I think is important, is that we can, we can put more animals, we can feed more animals in a hectare with these short, scrubby little plants than we have with a few large plants, uh, as we can see on the right side. Uh, we have a number of plants distributed around where it is the unbrowsed plants have only a few plants, uh, and it makes it very difficult for the animals to move around. And uh, to a certain degree, we try to document this uh, not only with numbers, but the various specimens. Uh, and on one in the green, you can see the browse plant, and then purple, we can see the uh, unbrowse plant. The terrarium taxonomists don't like to bring that botanical specimens into the terrarium, but sometimes they, we, we, we snook them and we sneak them in there, and we can see that they, we do have that documented. But there are other animals uh, that the taramar have manipulated. And one group is all up and been ignored, and that is the uh, uh, insects. And so here we can see the madronia tree. And in the madronia tree, we have some husband tree going on. They're propagating a wiki. This is the, uh, the madronia uh, butterfly, which they eat the larva. And uh, unfortunately, what's happened is that the government has brought in new social programs to take advantage of the forest. So they cut down these beautiful madronia trees and make rustic furniture. And now this whole system of animal husbandry is disappearing. And also in the tropical forest, as another example, we have this black, this uh, ahi that I mentioned earlier, uh, which is basic to the uh, the aguachile uh, and the region between chili pepper and this black, which grows only in the barrancas of Chihuahua. And this insect is only about one millimeter in diameter. But it's an interesting connection between the tropical tree Corsetta glandulosa, uh, the ants, and the scale insect. And because of the spraying for other crop sprouts in the, in, the, uh, in the dry tropical forest, this system is now disappearing. Nonetheless, the farmers continue trying to cut down these little branches, they say, to induce the ant to come to plant their seeds of ahi. Uh, we still haven't explained to them yet about the uh, importance of the toxic insect, but then for them this is the seed rather than the insect which produces this, this plant. So in summary, we can see that the Dharmara take advantage of the three different four systems. Um, uh, they have adapted, these are very adaptive systems incorporating not only uh, endemic species, but also introduced uh, processes such as European agriculture uh, and, and taking advantage of plants that adapt to their system. Uh, these are very important uh, biocultural resources and uh, they have uh, different modes of managing them, especially under adverse situations. These traditional practices have enhanced the productivity not only of these non-timber forest products, but also other biocultural uh, resources in cultural continuity. Climatic change and social political institutes at the present time uh, continue to challenge the Tarama, but we hope that their uh, millennium systems, uh, millennial systems, be able to adapt to the new situations. Thank you very much.
of uh, giving you an overview of what's going on in terms of the forest management in the state of Tarawana. There are certain things which uh, I won't be able to go into to great detail. Uh, and I'm saying that I think I voted the wrong version. Of the we'll, we'll go through it anyway. And so we'll uh, uh, take a look at uh, some things uh, from the viewpoint of indigenous peoples. Uh, I have unfortunately been able to, I haven't been able to load up all the information on the official forestry practices in Mexico, which similar to what Kat was talking about, well, and counter to uh, indigenous knowledge, indigenous practices. The first component, I think, which is important here, is to realize that this is a team effort. Uh, uh, on one hand, we have uh, uh, various members of our technical team, uh, as well as uh, community members and uh, various colleagues of different disciplines who are working with us, as well as different funding agencies, uh, both uh, uh, private as well as government agencies. So I think it's important that uh, there, uh, to show that there are certain uh, resources available and certain interests. Uh, first, I think it's important, uh, second of all, I think it's important to realize that Mexico is in a great academic boom in the moment. In terms of uh, looking at what's been done and looking into the future. And recently uh, there was a uh, book produced by some colleagues on uh, ethno agroforestry in Mexico. Uh, but as you can see, uh, most of the studies have been done in southern and central Mexico, and almost all of them have been focused on home gardens and coffee plantations, mainly because uh, there's a lot of money available to support that kind of work, uh, including uh, my, uh, my, uh, my technicians uh, for groups in this area. Is so uh, rather than focusing on the overview, which I originally planned to give uh, the, the, the ethno uh, forestry in Mexico, uh, what I'd like to do is look at from the viewpoint of uh, a group that has been uh, poorly studied from this viewpoint, but has had a lot of field work. That this is an area of Tarawana, in particular looking at plant people uh, interactions. And here we have to realize that there are various degrees of intensity of these interactions, and many of these actions be are conscious as well as non conscious. And uh, two components here are important. One is looking at the domestication continuum. Uh, rather than looking at something that was wild and then at one point was domesticated, we have to continue uh, the evolutionary processes and consequences of these human plant interactions. And then parallel to this, we have the management continuum, in which we have ecological modifications in the natural as well as anthropogenic communities, which uh, result in various products. And over time, uh, in space, we find that these interactions uh, have intensified. In, in domestication in particular, we have uh, most of our plants are synanthropogenic in the sense that uh, synanthropites that have evolved to live with humans and respond to their actions in different ways. Some of them end up being domesticates, and some of the domesticates can actually turn as turtles. Uh, we also have a management continuum which goes from spontaneous plant which can regenerate themselves without humans all the way to cultivated plants which require human intervention in the environment to survive. But we have a whole series of interactions in between, uh, from tolerated plants to protected plants to fermented plants, fermented plants that are encouraged with certain specific activities. Uh, some of our colleagues today have expanded this to 25 different categories, so I'm not going to go into that. I'll just leave it here at this, at this uh, five stage. The other point that's very important in Mexico at the moment is agroforestry is becoming a very difficult and very violent political issue. It's particularly when we take a look at this in terms of indigenous rights. Uh, in many indigenous groups today, we have uh, almost 65 ethno-linguistic groups in Mexico, are looking at uh, forestry rights as from the viewpoint of bicultural ethics, bicultural resources, and responsibilities. In particular, the cultural responsibility that they look at, depending on what the culture we're talking about, we translate into Mother Earth and Turtle Island and so forth, many, many of these concepts which are common to uh, Native Americans and First Nations people here north of the border. Also, many indigenous groups are looking at this in terms of decolonization, uh, of re recuperating their resources, their language, and their gastronomy. This leads us to questions about sovereignty, 
what role the forest plays in food sovereignty, food security, and sustainable development. So what I'd like to do is take you to uh, the little between California and, and the Amazon, and we'll head up to northwestern Mexico. Essentially, we're looking at uh, three major forest systems, which the Tarahumar uh, people inhabit. Uh, the forest systems in Mexico are divided into 40 different groups. We'll just look at the major vegetation farms that we have here, in particular the oak woodlands, white oak forest, and the dry tropical forest. We also have to realize that subsistence agriculture is very important in Mexico. A recent paper that was not published in, in the U.S. Uh, science journal, nor the Mexican science journal, had to be published in the philosophical transactions in England, in Transactions D. Uh, it just came out looking at official Mexican data on corn production and showed that about 70 80 percent of Mexico's corn consumption is produced by farmers who produce less than three tons a hectare and less than five hectares. That means that all the 99.9 percent .9 agricultural support from the government that goes to big agriculture, uh, it, it, it does not really help the uh, food security situation in Mexico. So we can take a look at this in another context with this map. And we can see that many of the green areas that are with subsistence agriculture uh, groups still live and still prosper. And this gives us to the important point that agriculture in Mexico, especially small-scale agriculture, is intimately associated with the forest. And in the state of Tarahumara, uh, we have about 10% of the species of Mexican flora. Mexi Mexico is one of the mega biodiversity countries of the world. And there we have over 2,000 species in, in the northwestern Mexico, along an ecological gradient, which gives us a, a, a tremendous advantage in terms of uh, compacting the number of species going uh, from uh, almost 3,000 meters down to 500 meters. This area uh, has been identified for the last century as the major source of forest products, on principally pine. Uh, but unfortunately, all the value has left this year uh, in terms of benefits uh, uh, for the Mexican population. And the inhabitants uh, have had serious problems. We can also take a look at this in terms of programs with, uh, oriented toward conservation. And it's interesting to see here on this map uh, the different conservation areas that have been developed in Mexico. I'm not saying they're all functioning because of very good financing, but these have been designated. And one of the important aspects as you see in northwestern Mexico is that this is an area which is dominated by indigenous people, in this case uh, by the Tarahumar, who are the stewards of the forest. But we can see in other parts of Mexico in the forested areas where such as agriculture coincides, uh, there are still indigenous people who are technically stewards uh, to these resources. And who are the Tarahumar, or as they refer to themselves, uh, um, uh, on one hand, it's sort of a difficult situation because when we as academics go in there, they don't know what we really are. And as you can see here by this cartoon, uh, they want to know how we make our living. And so it's a little difficult to, to get into things. But once you get immersed into the culture, you find that these are people as the, uh, I don't know which thing you, you press, but But as you can see here, uh, and one of the books by uh, Padre Pedro, at the top of that, okay. Is it back there? I don't see it, but uh, anyway, the, the book on the, on the right side is the concept, is the concept of the Tarmar. They're here to dance, to eat the earth and organ, or they're going to die, and we all will die. And you can see here that they, they do this through their ceremonies, they do this through their games, Game. They do this through a migratory commerce, moving products, forest products, uh, up and down the ecological gradient, and also drinking as we know. The corn cultivation basically is to produce fermented beer for the uh, various ceremonies that they carry out throughout the year. What I'd like to do now is just give you a few examples, and these are some of the main themes that I'll try to focus on. I'll give you an idea of how these people 
interact in terms of the agricultural production, usually on a scale of less than one hectare per family, uh, with the uh, different forest systems in the region. When we take a look at this, we realize that in the past, these people had a system for predicting what was happening with the climate. Uh, Lundholtz, the famous Norwegian explorer in the uh, late 1900s, documented a number of plants, a number of songs, a number of uh, uh, dances that were dedicated to different plants that responded to the climate and predicted when it was time to plant and when it was time to 